it was 13 years ago in January, that one of my youthful role models, a gentleman, a man, a fighter, a majestic human being that continues today as one of my role models, expired. I caught a plane that day without even going home, hearing of his passing, and I went to his funeral, just barely made it. I made a tape recording, Bill Marshall, of the last rites of one of the greatest human hmm. beings I ever knew, Paul Robeson. I went out to Mother Zion Church, where his brother once pastored, and I shall never forget it. I shall never forget Paul Robeson, and this is why I am urging you who watch this program to make sure you take advantage of this last week of William Marshall as Paul Robeson at the ETA Square. That's a theater at 7558 South Chicago Avenue. And we'll tell you more about the time of the show, the showings uh, right after this message. But Bill Marshall, I must tell you that you are a welcome sight on this program because in many ways, you represent, in essence, what Paul Robeson stood for. You've been consistent in your ideals, your dignity, and even in minute mannerisms. <laughs> they have, your dignity has a message for the youth of today of all races, and particularly young people of African-American descent. I welcome you on this eve of Black History Month, Afro-American History Month, and when I was a kid, of course, it was Negro History Month. Yes. William Marshall as Paul Robeson, a man to remember, right after this. <laughs> a magnificent voice. He had a magnificent bearing. He was majesty. He was elegance. But above all, Bill Marshall, he was commitment. His commitment, and he also had uh, a great <coughs> generosity of spirit. I've never seen it exercised in the fashion that Paul Robeson exercised his feelings about other people. Paul Robeson left us something that I think maybe a lot of us who have accomplished things left behind. Mm -hmm. And that was he never lost his identification of roots and obligation. He, he was the uh, supreme example of what I think Dr. W.E.B. Du Bois meant when he said, our people must have at least a talented tenth Yes. who will stand up for the masses, exactly. yes. who will represent us, who will speak yes. out for us. Here is one of the most eloquent men you ever met. But the, the world was introduced to Paul Robeson because he was a great performer, like mm -hmm. in Showboat. Yes. I think that's what put him over, that magnificent voice, which incidentally, uh, it's amazing, the similarity between your voice and Robeson. And then in Othella, then Paul Robeson toured Europe and he was in Egypt's Jericho. I think that's where that was made. And of course, the Emperor Jones. Mm -hmm. Both the stage version and the film. That's the Emperor Jones right there. Now, a lot of people would say that that was a degrading film. Why, I mean, a, a, a play. Why would he appear in it? How do you answer that? Well, he answers it in saying that he was probably one of those numerous Negro actors who made a separation between the content of a film and, uh, and the effects that it might have on the thinking of other people. And he was very unhappy about the film uh, after having seen it and having seen what the black press had to say about it, who were, were mm -hmm. thinking and, and were right on the head about it because they depicted him as a man who was cooperating with the concept of blacks being exploitative of each other. 
I know some young friends of mine saw Sanders of the River, which I think we've got some shots from. Mm -hmm. Or King Solomon's Mine, uh, I don't think you could have said that was a degrading thing, but Sanders of the River, uh, King Solomon's Mines, you see the dignity of him there. Yes. Uh, but Paul Robeson never lost his dignity, regardless of what he was performing in. No, no, it didn't. Of course, he got a, 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 a more high-profile, dignified presentation in Proud Valley. Mm -hmm. That World was II. his favorite film. But here yeah. is the one that's... With the Welch yeah. people, yes. But here's the one as Othello, mm -hmm. 1943. Uh, this is where you had a black man uh, caressing a white woman, mm -hmm. married to a white woman. Yes. But we got a little education out of that, didn't we? Yes, I think they the to raise <laughs> the consciousness of um, American theater going audiences, and we came to know something about the Moors. A lot of people today are, are have a hard time contemplating that black men uh, actually ruled that peninsula for many, uh, to, many to a great years. degree, mm -hmm. they were all Islamic. Mm -hmm. Paul, uh, Paul Robeson meant what to you? Means what to you today? Uh, <laughs> how could one say it uh, in, a, in a moment? He means. Uh, uh, <laughs> I can't, see, I can't answer that question <laughs> somehow. It means so it's much. A, it's an overwhelming thought, it's isn't it? It's an overwhelming thought. It really is. When uh, I saw Paul Robeson the first time walk into the Chicago Stadium, it's not like seeing the great basketball players. No. You, 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 of course, you are in, enamored with their performances. But you know, I must tell you that as a boy from down south, I didn't have to be told to be proud to be a black man, mm -hmm. to be a Negro at that time. Yes. Or an African American. Paul yes. Robeson said it all. Yes, he did. With that voice, the way he walked in, and the way he looked out yes. at the ground. How old were you when you first uh, saw Paul Robeson? In Nine years old. And you were affected, weren't you? Very much so. I've never seen anything like that before. Let's take some more shots at uh, what made Paul Robeson what it was. Tell us what you know about his background, uh, his ancestry. Well, uh, his um, father was born in North Carolina, a plantation slave, and he escaped when he was 15 years old, which would be 1860. He made his way to the north by way of the Underground Railroad and then fought in the Union Army. That is to say, he laid his life on the line um, in terms of making sure of What was his mother like? His mother was an extremely well-educated woman. Her name was Maria Louisa Bustill, and she was a teacher in, <coughs> in Philadelphia. And the father became a minister, uh, Reverend William Drew Robeson. And, uh, but she died uh, when Paul was six, so he says that he has no memory of her, really. And so the glory of his boyhood was his father. He was the fifth of uh, Reverend Robeson and Maria uh, Bustill's uh, children. And uh, the father and he had a very close relationship because they were at home together very often, although there were 53 years that separated them. The other kids had gone up to school, or uh, they were doing something that little older kids do. But Paul and his father played checkers, and they had great discussions, and uh, great, great nurturing went on there. And he said he was never stern except about making sure that he did his best at everything that he did. His not best. to be, not to be better than anyone else, but to be the best that you can be. And let me tell you, when he went to Rutgers, he was the best. He was the best of everything. Football <laughs> player. Football, but, javelin. He was at, the best javelin thrower look, there. Look at this picture here of Robeson on the Rutgers football team, and look at his dignity, his pride. It he is not separated from the, some of the other players just by race, but by his bearing. Yes. That's young Paul Robeson. A bearing and a rich lineage. <laughs> All-America, one of the first black All-America football players, was he not? I think so. Walter King? Yes, yeah. two years in succession. And graduated uh, valedictorian. But lest we forget, he was Phi Beta Kappa, which is about the highest honor society you can get in, in college, mm -hmm. is it not? Mm -hmm. 
Look at Paul Robeson. 1919, black. 1919, brown. he would have been about 21 mm -hmm. at that point. D and he gave the class address when he graduated, did he not, from Rutgers? He was a valedictorian. Yeah. You know what? He was obligated. <laughs> you, you, you know what uh, I heard him say once that his own teammates on the football team in practice uh, tried to maim him. Well, we know about that more recently with, with Jackie Robinson in uh, 47. Yes, of course they did. And he uh, withstood all that. Uh, they would not allow him to sing in the glee club. Can they told him that he sang off pitch. <laughs> <laughs> the great Paul Robeson. Yes. They're not, this is a new one. I can't imagine that. Paul Robeson. Maybe we can hear a little more of his voice in the background soon. But can you imagine not permitting Paul Robeson to sing in the glee club? Yes, that's the kind but of But the thing is, he didn't him. let it get him down. No. No. His father liked to hear him sing. That was all that was mine. <laughs> Uh, did you ever get to meet his, his wife, Islanda? Oh, yes, yes. I came to know her reasonably well. I met her in, in London. Uh, we were both in a theater. This would have been about 1964, and Laurence Olivier was portraying a fellow on the stage. And uh, when it was all over, I saw her walking down the aisle, and I was standing there just sort of transfixed, wondering what I had seen, because I wasn't at all pleased with it. And she said, oh, Mr. Marshall. I said, yes, oh, Miss Robson, how are you? She said, I guess I'm all right, but what was that? <laughs> Honestly. <laughs> uh, Paul's wife and his son, when you look at this home of theirs in Connecticut, uh, you recognize what a sacrifice he made because eventually he lost his home. And we've got some scenes here, Paul, his wife and son, uh, in Connecticut around 1941. Eventually, he lost that magnificent home because he was willing to stand up for his people. Yes. That's the only way you can explain it. Look at yes. this. Beautiful place, and uh, we don't see the, in, uh, all of the magnificence of that thing, but he lost it mm -hmm. because they decided to, to ban him from all of those high contracts. Any kind of contract, any concert hall. Uh, no traveling permitted. His passport had been taken from him. If you were to sum up Paul Robeson in terms of historical impact, have you got a way of putting it? Because you're an authority on him. I'm not really an authority. I'm just uh, a, a very devoted uh, and, and very uh, respecting of this unique life and the example that it set for youth of our, our, our period. But uh, I, I think I said it earlier, I've never met a human being ever who had such a generosity of spirit. And willing to put his life on the line for his convictions. I th wouldn't you have to say that? Yes, that's, that's uh, did, did Robeson uh, die a poor man? Not necessarily. I mean, I don't, I, I, yes, but uh, I think his last years he was uh, uh, low in funds. But he he became very rich in many ways when he went to live in Harlem, and he made the decision to live in Harlem during that period that the State Department was sitting on his passport. He knew that they were wrong about that, but litigation and so on takes a while, and I think he knew it would take seven, eight years or so. And the people of Harlem came to know Paul Robeson. He wasn't a man carrying uh, a bomb and, or a, a suitcase. Uh, well, they tried to, to make him out to be a subversive and everything you could think of. Yes, but th to the people of Harlem. And he also uh, was um, a publisher of a newspaper, Freedom. And Lorraine Hansberry was one of the writers for it. Chicago, Alice Lorraine Children's Hansberry, yeah. was one of the writers for it. And uh, I came to know him during that period. And it was a nurturing period for everyone. He went to church every Sunday, his, his uh, brother's church, the Mother Amy Zion. He never sang a solo, he sang in the choir. And afterwards, the, the ladies uh, who brought food so that they could have a camp meeting, so to say, with, with Paul Robeson afterwards, uh, I'm sure never forgot the experience, nor did he. It was just such a, a rich, well, warm exchange that they had. And for, again, the people of Harlem to come to know him, it was important to them. And to him. You know, while I'm listening at your reflections, I, I wish more people 
young people could come to know this man. I think there can be a ripple effect on one personality on another. I don't believe there are many young people of all races generally, but particularly young African Americans who could be around William Marshall very long and feel that they do don't have something to contribute, that there is an inner dignity. This is William Marshall from Gary, Indiana, not from outer space. <laughs> <laughs> a great actor, and we want to tell you how you can see him perform soon, right after this. Get on board, little children, get on board, little children, get on board, little children, there's room for many of more. The gospel trains are coming, I hear it just at hand. Here are we rumbling and rolling through the land of get on board. Resurrection time for Paul Robeson the dignity, the majesty, the commitment of this man, Paul Robeson, African-American hero, as interpreted by William Marshall, distinguished craftsman and artist. Well, thank you. This is an excerpt from Mr. Robeson's autobiography, a very brief book that he wrote while he was under virtual uh, house arrest, you might say, while waiting for the State Department to uh, return his passport to him, to do the legal thing. Around that period. This is why it was in Harlem, and this would be, uh, I would say, between 1952 and 58, which is when he got his passport back. And he states that, for well over 300 years, my people have been a part of American life and history, and my life is dedicated first and foremost to winning nothing less than full freedom for my people in America. At the outset, let me make it clear that I care nothing, less than nothing, about what the lords of the land think of me and my ideas. For more than 10 years, they persecuted me in every way they could, by slander and mob violence, by denying me the right to practice my profession as an artist, revoking my passport, and withdrawing my right to travel abroad. To these, the real un-Americans, I merely say, all right, I don't like you either. But I do care, and deeply, about the America of the common people whom I have met across the land, the working men and women whose picket lines I've joined, auto workers, seamen, cooks, stewards, furriers, miners, steel workers, the foreign born, the various nationality groups, the Jewish people with whom I've been especially close, and the middle class progressives, the people of the arts and sciences, the students, yes, the students, all of that America of which I sing, the et cetera's and the and so forths that do the work. But most of all, I am mindful of the Negro people and the questions they ask me as I meet them in the Harlems of America. Uh, many of those questions deal with my views and activities because I have been the center of controversy. William Marshall, I think if Paul Robeson could come back today, he would say, if there is a voice who should speak for me on stage, it would have to be William Marshall. <laughs> and I'd have to return the compliment William, to the stage uh, back to we've you. We've got a few more days left. This show is taped, of course, is being shown on Sunday. When can people see you at the ETA Square? Uh, Thursday, Friday, Saturday night at 8 p.m. and at 3 and 7 on Sundays. There you have it on the screen. This is something you've got to do. This is not a charitable contribution to support ETA Square. This is a must. This is a pre-African-American uh, History Month special yes. with you, Bill, and we appreciate your coming. Well, that should be a, a 12-month uh, Did you ever get a, anyway. Did you ever get a chance to meet one of Paul Robeson's great friends, Dr. W.E.B. Du Bois. We may have some photographs of, of them together here. Yes, I did. I did come to know uh, both he and Shirley Graham. In fact, I attended a party in London, which was a farewell party for their uh, going to live and reside in Africa. You know, one of the things that uh, I found remarkable, distinctively remarkable about both men, of course, Du Bois was a scholar and a writer and a poet, and another committed man who was willing to sacrifice his body mm -hmm. for the cause. It was 1943, uh, and he also picketed the White House, and then he 
had that great peak skill experience when a mob of yes. people broke out to try to keep a black American hero from speaking. Uh, we don't have enough time to talk about Paul Robeson. But no, there isn't enough time. <laughs> uh, I appreciate you coming here and reciting that one message of, about his commitment from his book. Yes. Well, the book again, maybe some people would like to buy that book. Here I stand. Here is a book from which these pictures were taken that I suggest you go to the African American bookstore on South Cotty inspired. We do need role models. Yes. And we do have a history. And we do have our heroes that I think sometimes we forget too soon. Glad you've been here. Thank and, you. And Abena uh, John Brown. another chance to promote a book of photographs that I think can impact on young minds. This man that you're looking at now had a dramatic influence on my life. So if people wonder why I continue to stick my head out, sometimes defying the odds, don't blame me, blame Paul Robeson. <laughs> and the times. Uh, that's right, Paul <laughs> Robeson rubbed something off on me and didn't even know it and that is you got to be committed you got to take a stand and you got to stand up for what you think is correct and don't forget your roots and your people you got to be somebody and when you when you forget your roots and your people you ain't nobody absolutely uh, this book is published by citadel press is titled the whole world the whole world in his hands. Now, I've been making a mistake all the way through here, and I'm glad I've got a friend here to correct me. The pronunciation of Paul's last name is Robeson, R-O-B-E-S-O-N. And there's a long story behind this that maybe you'll get a chance one day to hear Bill Marshall <laughs> tell you about how Robeson convinced some other people that he was no longer a slave by the use of his name. This man is appearing at the ETA Square and you've got to buy some tickets because they're reasonable, they are student rates, and we're going to hope we have time to flash a, a phone number on the screen because you ought to hear the life of Paul Robeson as interpreted through Bill Marshall. I am Vernon Jarrett uh, enjoying another elegant moment with a friend, a true Thank craftsman you. and an artist. Thank Bill, you. this is not flattery. <laughs> I know. You are one of the most underrated actors by Hollywood's conception in the world. Not really. My family likes me. <laughs> and the people who watch you like you. Good day. Mm -hmm.